they can do in their lives is follow where the Lord in heaven to go. Amen. I hope you had a good one. At least the uh, good food, good friend, good family. That's it's always good. We did and certainly enjoyed it. He eat on that meal for a couple of days. So that's always good too. Oh, yeah. And so I appreciate everything the Lord's done. Hope you'll come tonight, five o'clock. We'll have service. Avery's preaching tonight. And uh him and uh he'll be heading back tonight. I assume that means Peyton will be heading back tonight. Where's Peyton? She's in the nursery. Peyton will be heading back tonight. Anna and Zach will be heading back today. Yeah, so they'll be. So uh, things going to quiet down over to Raby household. <laughs> and uh, I would say things quiet down at the Lawson household, but I can't imagine Peyton making that much noise. <laughs> but uh, but be praying for them. Maybe just a few more weeks and a couple weeks they'll be back home. Some of them will for Christmas and stuff. But be praying for them as they get their final exams and stuff. But tonight, um, Everybody says, well, what is pies and praise? Well, I think the name sort of gives it away. Pie and praise. Yeah. You say, well, if I come for pie, do I have to praise? Well, no, but you have opportunity to, and that's up to you. Uh, we don't force anybody to do anything, but it's just a good time of fellowship opportunity. So come tonight, and uh, we'll have pie and praise and preaching. Pies and praise and preaching is what we're going to do. So, uh, and so yeah. come tonight. We're looking forward to it. And then next week's our Christmas dinner for our evening service. It will constitute our evening service. And so I hope you come to it also. Always good times of fellowship. Coming on is quick, ain't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. Too quick. Yeah, so that's the way it is. Let's open our Bibles to John chapter number one. John chapter number one. And uh, we'll preach this morning. I guess if ain't nobody else looking at me, boy, that grandbaby's got her eyes on me, so I'm preaching to her. <laughs> John chapter number one, and uh, as soon as you find your place, if you'll stand, and I guess I better get this microphone on if it's working. Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. I forgot what I was doing. So, yeah. Look with me down here, verse number one of, of John chapter one. And the Bible says, uh, in, the, in these passages of Scripture, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which light of every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray together over the reading of God's word. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to open your word this morning. Thank you for the time that we've had in Sunday school, the time we've had of fellowship, the time we've had of singing this morning. We, Lord, we want to lift your name up. You're worthy of all praise and all honor and all glory. And we're thankful for the love that you love us with. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for salvation. God, I pray for the next little bit that you'd head this place round about, remove anything from our minds or from this building that would hinder or quench us, Lord, that would distract us from hearing and heeding what thus saith the word of God. I pray, Lord Jesus, you'd give me clarity of speech and mind to be able to say the things that are necessary for this congregation, needful for this hour. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd just uh, give me unction to preach. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You be seated. Thank you for reverence the word of God. I want to preach on these verses this morning. And, and uh, I was thinking we've, we've entered into uh, the Christmas season, if you will. Thanksgiving, I think, is a good way to kick that off. Amen. I think it ought to run all the way from Thanksgiving uh, till next Thanksgiving. And then pick up again. But I think it's a good way uh, to pick up the uh, Christmas season on that. And I, 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 I'm glad that uh, we've got a lot to be thankful for. And let me say, listen to me, this is important. There's a lot of things to complain about. Yeah. They are. I'm not, I, listen, I'm not going to pretend there's not. There's a lot of things to complain about. There's a lot of things that we could. People are struggling. Personally, I'm struggling. I'm going to be honest with you. There's a lot of things to complain about. Uh, some of us have 
uh, over the past weeks, even people in this church got bad news from the doctor. I mean, uh, bang, I, I mean, that's hard to get right here at Thanksgiving and Christmas and try to uh, imagine doing that. They, some of you sitting here right now that have seen uh, terrible things. They, some of us in here going through terrible uh, situations and circumstances. So I'm not going to pretend that there's things not happening. I understand they are. There's a lot of things that we can complain about. But I'd submit to you that in spite of all the things that are going on, there's still a lot of things to be thankful for. Amen? Amen. And uh, uh, sometimes we have to do the work. Sometimes we have to dig through the mess to find the things to be thankful for. And the reason for that is not because good things are, 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 are hard to find. Uh, it's just that we allow bad circumstances to cloud our vision sometimes. And we have to push that stuff aside and focus on the good things that God's doing for us. Because I can tell you this, that sometimes it looks like only things are bad. But I want you to realize that God is good. Amen. God is always good. God can't never be anything but good, and, and God does not change. Ain't that great? The Bible says over in James 1, 17, every good gift and every perfect gift uh, is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of his turning. That says God cannot change, and that every good thing in your life comes from him. Amen. Amen. Uh, it goes on to say of his own will, he begot us with the word of truth. And so I'm just simply submitting to you today that there's a whole lot of things that we've got to be thankful for and we ought to be thankful for them because the Lord's been good to us and he can't be nothing but good to us. And, and I was thinking about that. The, over in John, uh, we read over here, uh, uh, as we've seen at the end of, uh, uh, when we got to the end of James 1, verse number 18, where it says, His own will begins with the word of truth. Interestingly, it leads us over here to John chapter number 1, where it says, In the beginning was the word. Amen. And, and I like that. And I want you to understand that when we begin reading this, and I told you we're in the Christmas season, and so I want to focus on this, but every gospel writer uh, took one facet of, of the birth of Jesus Christ and wrote about it. For example, over in the book of Matthew, if you turn to the book of Matthew and you look at the birth of Jesus Christ, Matthew decided to go all the way back to uh, the genealogy of, of the Jewish people, all the way back to Abraham. He, he started way back there and Matthew in doing the birth of Jesus he began working his way up till he got to Mary and Joseph and they're in the lineage of Jesus Christ and Matthew and his essence trying to prove when Jesus was born that Jesus was not just born but he was born to be king of the Jews that he was of the line of David and he is rightful heir to the throne of God out of the throne of David over in Israel. And so that's what Matthew did. If you go over to the book of Luke, Luke goes on the birth of Jesus and he starts over there in Nazareth. And then he takes us to Bethlehem and he's standing there and he's talking about uh, Mary there and the angel coming to Mary and making the announcement to Mary that Jesus would be born and, and uh, going to uh, 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 Joseph and telling him about the birth of Jesus. And then over in Luke chapter number two is where we get the stories of the uh, uh, shepherds and the wise men and, and uh, the angels and all that. And that's how Luke decided he was going to go about the birth of Jesus Christ. John went all the way back to eternity past. John went past the genealogy, past Bethlehem, past Nazareth, to a point in time when there was nothing. And he said, when you get to a point in time in eternity past when there was nothing, he said, I want to tell you, Jesus was there. Amen. Amen. And he was all the way back there when we get there. And so what John's trying to establish for us, Matthew's establishing Jesus as king of the Jews. Luke was trying to establish for us that Jesus was 100% human, uh, had come into the flesh. And John establishes for us that Jesus is indeed God. Amen. And so I, I want to look at that this morning. And I want to preach on this thought, God's Christmas gift. God's Christmas gift. Now notice with me, if you'll look with me in John chapter number 1, the Bible says here uh, 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 about what's happening, we see the divine life in essence. And so if you're right, taking notes, write that down. The divine life in essence. Jesus was indeed the Son of God. John does not waste time arguing with us about who you think Jesus is. John simply says, as God did over in uh, Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. They don't seek to try to prove to you that there was a God. They just simply say that that's the fact. Well, John does the same thing. John takes us all the way back to the beginning, and he says, in the beginning was the Word. 
Now this is capital W word. Amen. This is speaking of a person. This is not just speaking of, 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 of a word or something we can have in our hands. And so he begins with the Lord as being an a, a ineffable person. Now you say, preacher, what does ineffable mean? Well, ineffable means uh, uh, that it's, they're too great to try to describe with words. Amen? That's what Jesus is. He's too great to try to describe with words. But I'm going to try this morning with John's help out of John chapter 1 to tell you who Jesus is. Uh, first and foremost, we find him here. The Bible says that Jesus is eternally God. Amen? He is eternally God. What that means, to equate Jesus with God, you've got to understand, that's why they crucified Jesus. Because Jesus said he was God, and they said it was blasphemy. And so John's doing this, and so John is saying, listen, in the beginning was the Word. Now, in the beginning does not refer to a start. Uh, uh, it refers to an infinite state. Because God always has been. Jesus always has been. The Holy Spirit always has been. There's never been a period of time where they ever ceased to exist or were not. They always were. The Greek word when John uses here describing Jesus in the beginning was the word. He uses the word logos, uh, uh, which is a Greek word. And the word logos refers to as the thinker or the creative genius behind the created universe. And so he goes all the way back and describes Jesus as the word, Logos, the creative genius behind the creation of the world. And so he goes on that. And let me say, it don't exhaust what he's saying here. There's a lot of stuff here. I, I will tell you something. John, in just a few sentences here, has said a whole lot uh, that take us all eternity trying to figure out. But I want you to understand. He said, in the beginning was the word. And so we're going to look at the word Logos, which is word. We also got to look at the verb, which was was. And the word was here does not mean used to be that they, he was the word, but it's an ongoing. It's, it, it suggests the idea of absolute uh, subtemporal existence, which means not only in the beginning was the word, but today is the word, and tomorrow will be the word, that the word will never cease to be the word, that he's always going to be that way. And not only was the word the word, the word was always uh, going to be, never cease to be, then, today, and tomorrow with God, and the word was, always was, always going to be, was God. Amen. Amen. He'll never cease to exist. And so I want you to understand, we don't see that so much in the English translation of this, but when you get a hold of that uh, and think about it, it refers to an existence that transcends time. Now I understand, time is a device that helps us as finite beings uh, to relate to our existence. But John is not speaking to a period of time. John is speaking to a period where there was no time. John is speaking of a place where time did not matter. The world did not have a, a the word did not have a beginning. It's always been. And the word will never have an ending. It will always will be. Because in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and God will always be. Amen. 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 The word belongs to eternity. We can go back in our minds quite easily a century to a year or two ago. Uh, maybe when we were kids, we can think about stuff like that. But it's hard for us to think about a period of time where there was nothing. But John says when we think of Jesus, that's where we got to begin. All the way back there where there was nothing, Jesus was. Amen? He's eternally God. Secondly, he's equally God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. In other words, there was more than one person within the Godhead, and Jesus is one of these people. You say, preacher, you can't prove that. The Bible proves it from the very first verse. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. The word God in the, in, in the Hebrew is Elohim. Elohim is plural. In the beginning, God, uh, the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Ghost was there. They created the heavens and the earth. You understand? Uh, when we find that. So in by, when you think about the Trinity, and this is what John's talking about, you don't think about the Trinity as one plus one plus one, because one plus one plus one is three. But when you think about the Trinity, it's one times one times one, and that's one. Amen. Good. Amen. The three is always one. And, and so understand that from both Old and New Testaments, we arrive at the concept of God existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You say, well, I don't understand that. Well, difficult as that concept is to grasp, we're not left without illustrations in the world. I mean, because we look around, our universe is space, matter, and time. But it's our universe. 
but three things constitute our universe. If we look at uh, space, space is triumph, it's length, breadth, and height. But it's all space. If we look at uh, matter, matter is energy, motion, and phenomena. Uh, but all that constitutes matter. If we look at time, time is past, present, future, but time is still time. These three are one. They constitute time. And so we see that. So when John says about Jesus, the word was with God, he's stating a sublime truth that Jesus is equally God with the Father, uh, God with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. He's God the Son, the second person of the Godhead. And in the beginning, he was there. He also says Jesus is essentially God. This is your third thing. It says the word was with God, and guess what? The word was God. Amen. Amen. That is his essence and what he actually is, his nature, his person, his personality, his attributes. He is God. All these characteristics of deity belong to him. He is God. When you got saved, then Jesus saved your soul. God saved you. Amen. I want you to know that when Jesus died on the cross, God died on the cross. Amen. Amen? We understand that. Uh, his, he, Jesus exists in his own right, uh, uh, independent of all creation. Uh, you know, God's got, does God have the wisdom and the power to create a hundred billion galaxies uh, and, and hold that world in through space uh, uh, in inconceivable paths? Does God have that ability? Well, so does Jesus. You say, why? Because he's God. You gotta understand the Bible says God is a spirit, and they that worship uh, uh, him must worship him in spirit and truth. God the Father is a spirit uh, which has no body. The Holy Spirit is a spirit, thus by its name, the Holy Spirit. The only physical manifestation of God that you can see with your eyes is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God coming to flesh. Amen. And so that's the uh, when we're looking at these things, Jesus, uh, in these things, he's eternally God uh, when we see it. He's equally God. He's essentially God. That's the Lord's ineffable person. You say, I didn't, I, I didn't get all that. I told you before I started that it cannot be described in words. So I did the best I could. <laughs> Number two, notice the Lord's infinite power. Jesus is unique in the fact that he's got infinite power. Notice what the Bible says. All things were made by him. Who? Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. Jesus. The Word. Jesus was with God. The Word. Jesus was God. All things were made by him. Who? Jesus. And without him was not anything made that was made. All things were made by him. Notice that means all things individually and all things separate. It's a reference to the infinite detail of creation. Don't make too little of the statement when it says all things were made by him because we overlook things that were made. Do you know? I mean, think about that. The astronomers, if you were an astronomer, if you watched work for NASA, they measure things in light years. All right, light years means uh, 186,273 miles per second. That's fast, buddy. Yeah. I mean, you're getting up the road. Now, I, I want you to understand, 186,273 miles per second, our sun, by that measure, is eight light minutes away. Don't sound too far till you multiply 186,273 by eight miles per second. Yeah. I'm just simply saying, and, and uh, I want you to understand, uh, our sun's that way. But out there, out in space, there are suns and stars believed to be billions of light years away. You say there's more suns and stars out there? There is. There's things we're not ever going to discover out there. I'm telling you, nor can we count the stars or guess how many billions of stars are. And Genesis says when God created them, he created the stars also. Flick his fingers and he created the stars. Yeah. Some stars are so large that it's beyond our, even our comprehension to do it. The star Antares, for example, could hold 64 million suns the size of ours. Wow. In the constellation Hercules, there's a star that can contain 100 million stars the size of Antares. So in Terry's can hold uh, 64 uh, million of our suns, but in Hercules, uh, there's, a, there's a star there that can hold uh, 100 million of the Antares. I mean, it's pretty bad. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 100 light years in diameter, 100,000 light years in diameter. The Milky Way, where we live. 100,000 light years in diameter. It's revolving at the speed of 200 miles per hour. You didn't feel like you was going that fast, did you? It takes two million years to complete one revolution on its axis. Two million. Going, going at 100,000 
light year, this 100,000 light year, takes 2 million years to make one circle, which means you'll never see it in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. Jesus created that. Mm -hmm. Is it, I mean, you understand that. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And not only are we all by the size of space and the, the stars were overwhelmed by the precision which he, uh, the, these uh, galaxies and stuff pursue their appointed path. Our planet, for example, uh, the Earth, it don't travel in a true circle. It travels in three directions at the same time. It revolves on an axis. Why it's revolving on an axis, so why it's spinning at the same time. And, and its path is deflected by other planets uh, magnetically. So the Earth spins in three directions at one time in very precise manner. Otherwise, we'd freeze to death or we'd burn up uh, like some of the other planets are in, uh, inhabitable. But God has made it thus that way. I want you to understand, uh, our earth spinning in three different directions in all existence has never lost more than one hundredth of a second every hundred years. If we look at the world of, uh, uh, go from the infinitely large, which is space, to the world of the infinite, infinitely small, uh, the building block of the entire universe is an atom. You ever seen one? No, you haven't. Uh, because it's so small uh, that each one is less than 150 millionth of an inch in diameter. You ain't never seen one. You might have seen a drawing in a book, but you ain't never seen one. <laughs> if we took the atoms from a single drop of water, if you took the atoms out of it and converted it to grains of sand, just out of one drop of water, there'd be enough sand to build a concrete highway half a mile wide from New York to San Francisco. That's how small an atom is. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He made it all. Amen. You understand that? If you look at the complexity of each living thing, each cell in a living creature contains 200 billion molecules of atom. The nucleus of a cell, the center of, of an atom, is less than four-tenths of a thousandth of an inch in diameter. I don't know how to describe that to you. There's no way. It's too small. I can't even tell you what to think of to think of it that way. We've got to do that. And then the membrane that encloses the, the cell's component are one half of that. So it's even smaller than that. Uh, or one millionth of an inch thick. Think about that. Because when Jesus was creating, you say, well, he created the trees and he created the stars and he created, he created them atoms too. The Bible says without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus made it all. Not... Without, when it says uh, without him was not anything made that was made, that means not even one thing. There was nothing made that Jesus didn't make. You understand? Because in the beginning was the word. Notice his power of communication. It says in him was life. And the light was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness. Jesus communicated life. And, and all about it. Life coming from the dust. And could you imagine how, how many of y'all ever had to dust your house? Anybody? Some of you dusted your house. Some of you don't. But you still got dust. But I challenge you to go home and dust your house and then take that dust and pile it up best you can and make something out of it. <laughs> you can't make that. You make something out of mud. You make something out of sand. You can't make anything out of dust. Dust has no form. But yet the very God of heaven, Jesus Christ himself, in the beginning was the word. All things were made by him. And without him was not made anything that was made. Jesus took dust and made us. I'm telling you, that's life. And it says not only that, he communicated life, he communicated the lady life. The world's a dark world, and Jesus came into the world to bring light into the world. And that brings us to our second thought, the divine light in evidence. Notice this. We see it mentions John the Baptist here uh, as a witness to that light. And so the witness we see right here in this narrative is John. John, whose life was comprised of life and light, uh, was a witness to that true light. And so we see the messenger come, John the Baptist. And it says, John the Baptist about there, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear a witness of that light. He's bearing witness to the capital L, light, because he's talking about Jesus, who is also the capital W. You word. Right. It says he came to bear witness of that light, but all men through him, who? The light might believe. And so John, the messenger, is doing that. His motive for doing that is so that people will believe. Yeah. 
so that people will put their faith in the Lord. You remember John the Baptist out there baptizing in the Jordan and, and he's down there and one day Jesus comes across the hills there while John's baptizing and John stops what he's doing and he points to Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God has taken away the sins of the world. John the Baptist knew it wasn't him, but there was one coming after him whose shoes he wasn't worthy to lack. And here comes Jesus and John said, That's him. Follow him. He must increase, I must decrease. That's what John the Baptist said. And so John the Baptist knew that Jesus was light, and he testified to that. Notice his method. He was not that capital L light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. A good illustration of this is the sun and the moon. Did you know the moon has no light in and of itself? If there was no sun, there would be no moon. All the moon is is a rock that reflects sunlight. You can tell when the sun burns out because the moon won't burn because it has no light in and of itself. That's what John the Baptist said. He said, he's the sun, I'm the moon. I'm just showing you what he is in our lives. That's what we need to do. But notice the world and the light. Verse number nine, the Bible says this. This was that true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I want you to realize that when Jesus came, when the, world, when the word came, light was finally revealed. 400 silent years before we come into the book of Matthew at the end of the Old Testament where people had turned their back on God and rejected going through the motions. But then we get to the New Testament. Guess what? Light came. Amen? And we see that. The Bible says this was that true light, the light of every man that cometh in the world. Every man, every person without distinction. All, did you know all have some light? Ain't nobody going to be able to say they don't have any. The Bible says over in Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There's enough light that Jesus brought into the world where anybody can come and have a knowledge that there is a God. God holds people responsible for the light they have. Let me tell you, the United States of America, we have more light than a lot of countries have, and God will not hold you guiltless for the light that's been exposed to us. Amen. Uh, in lands that have known the full blaze of the light of Christ, uh, people are without excuse. Notice, though, the Bible says in verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. Now imagine this, nothing more astonishing to me that people would reject light. The only reason I can find why somebody would reject light is because they're trying to do something they ain't supposed to be doing. Every evil thing is done in the dark. Now, we're living in a world right now that's increasingly trying to move stuff from the dark to the light. I'll be honest with you, I don't see it. Put it back in the dark. Amen. I'm telling you right now, the Bible says he was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Could you imagine Jesus walking on the very creation he made, the earth he made, uh, grabbing blades of grass that he made, breathing air that he made, uh, uh, standing and fishing in water that he made, Jesus doing all these things, and the people that live with him at that point in time, rubbing shoulders with the very creator of the universe, the very creator that put them into existence, and yet they knew him not. Could you imagine being that close to God and not know it? But how many people sit on our church pews week after week this close to God but walk out of here without knowing him as personal Savior? Amen. The Lord was resisted by his creatures. That's what, what it says there, but it says he's also resisted by his own countrymen. He came to his own. That's the Jewish people. And his own received him. Could you imagine going to the people that all to know you, the people that do know you, the people that love you, all these things. I imagine what they said. To the Jewish people, the prophets had foretold it, the regathering in the Babylonian exile, the cold deadness, the formality of religion, and all these things. John the Baptist rose up to tell them about it, tell them that this person's coming and all this stuff. But Jesus was not the kind of Messiah they wanted. They didn't want some meek and lowly Jesus. They wanted somebody with a sword in his hand, somebody riding on a horse, somebody to come and conquer Rome, and so they rejected it. But I'm glad that Jesus came meek and lowly as he did to die for uh, uh, their sins and mine. Amen. Notice what verse 12 says. The light, however, was not only uh, revealed and resisted, it was received. And here's but, but as many as received him. I like reading the word. We talk about it in Sunday school. When you read the word but, it changes the whole train of thought. Everybody's rejected him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to believe on his name. I want you to understand. 
Thank God that uh, all the story that he was rejected, some did. This describes the spiritual birth of the child of God. As many as received him, to them gave he power. That is the right or the authority to become the sons or the children of God. We've got to note three verbs here. Believe, receive, and become. Amen? Because that's what happened to me one day. Believe and receive and becoming. The day I got saved. A new child is born in the family of God and that process revolves around them three words. Believe, receive, and become. First, we must believe. Believe on his name. Uh, his name's not mentioned here, but there's no doubt we're talking about Jesus. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Amen. So why are we to believe on his name? Well, his name's the key to our salvation. When you get over there to Matthew, when, they're, uh, when he's talking about over Matthew chapter number uh, one, where the angel was telling Joseph uh, that uh, Mary was going to have a child, and he said, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The only name whereby we can be saved is the name of Jesus. Amen. To believe on his name is to believe what it signifies. And it signifies that he can save uh, his people from our sins. We need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great step to arrive at the point where you believe. But belief means nothing if you don't receive. You see, believing don't put me in the family of God. Receiving puts me in the family of God. And so the second part of the equation is to receive him. It's as many as received him to them became the sons of God, even though they don't believe on his name. It's not enough just to believe that Jesus is Savior. He's got to become your Savior. It's not enough to believe that Jesus can save you. You've got to let him save you. Amen. Amen. The only way this is, can happen is for me to receive him. That step involves inviting Jesus, allowing the Lord Jesus to be Lord of my life and, and doing that, to live and reign and, and to follow him. And so how does believing and receiving make one a child of God? Well, that's our part. When we do, uh, when we do our part of believing and receiving, God does his part and we become a child of God. He imparts new life. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell us, uh, bringing with it the life of God. And so we get in there and uh, our spirit regenerates and uh, we pass from death into life. We share a divine nature. Did you know that you are partakers of a divine nature because you've been born again? We become the children of God. And by com compare and contrast, notice this, we see the supernatural birth of the child of God. The Bible says, which were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. If that verse is correct, and it is, it shows that a person's new birth is not, first off, of human descent. You didn't get saved because it's not of, uh, what I'm saying is it's not of blood. Just because my mom and daddy were saved didn't mean I'd get saved. Didn't mean I was saved. Just because my grandpa was a preacher didn't mean I was saved. Just because my family before me went. It's not of blood. Uh, it does not make me one of God's children. That's not where it comes from. It's not a human desire. It says it's not of the will of flesh. Because you don't know no amount of wishful thinking is going to make you saved. I might, wish I, 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 I might wish I was a child of a millionaire, but it don't make, make it so, does it? I may live in a fantasy world where I convince myself that I am the son of a millionaire, but it don't make it true, does it? Not no more than standing in the garage makes you a car. You, you understand? It, it's foolish to that. It's not of human desire. You can't wish yourself to be saved in order to be saved. And not only that, it's not of human design. It's not of the will of man. No amount of parental or personal resolve can make me your child of God. What I'm saying is my mama can't go and say, Jesus, I want you to save my boy and Jesus do it. It's got to be up to me to make that decision and to ask Jesus my personal Savior. Your parents your parents can have you baptized. We dedicate we dedicate babies here when they're born. I don't believe in baby baptism. I believe you get baptized after you say. But we dedicate babies here. But let me tell you something. I'm sure some dedicate the baby to God does not save them. They'll have to come to a decision one day where they trust Jesus and the free part of sin allowing him to be the Lord of their life. I want you to understand, it's a, it's a new birth. And, and listen, uh, it's, it's, we are born of God according to three spiritual laws given in verse number 12. It's not from the uh, blood, not of the will of flesh, not of the will of man. We thank God uh, about Jesus and his eternal, infallible Godhead that made life and life and the ability to save all mankind. The Jesus that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and all things were made by Him and without Him was not anything that was made. Every star, every atom, every galaxy, everything that we don't know anything about. A God that was able to speak life to dust and dust come to life. A God that was able to bring light into a dark world. A God that was able to do that. And you know what He done? 
The Bible says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is only begotten of the Father. Can I tell you something here? That John in one statement gave us the whole story of Christmas. What it's all about. The word was made flesh. This God from eternity past that will last to eternity future, he became flesh and dwelt among us. Can I say that John ignores all the wonderful stories? He don't talk about donkeys and sheep in a, in a stable in Bethlehem. He don't talk about a manger or King Herod. He don't talk about shepherds in the field. He says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. The birth of the Lord Jesus was unique. Jesus, when, when any other child's born into this world, they're born with a new personality, a new life created that never existed before. But when Jesus was born, it was not a creation of a new personality. Jesus had always existed. It was the coming into the world of a person that existed for all eternity. Jesus came to this world. The Word was made flesh. He describes the incarnation using four words. It took Luke 2,500. You understand that? John says the Word dwelt among us. That, the idea from the Greek is he tabernacled among us. The tabernacle. God came to dwell among us. The tabernacle was all glorious within. If you read about it in the Old Testament, but the glory was hidden. If you walk by the tabernacle just going through the desert, all you'd see is a tent. That's all it looked like. On the outside, it was made of copper. You, you would just say, well, there's just another tent. It's set away from the other ones, but it's, uh, on the outside, it just looks ordinary. But if, if you ever got the opportunity to go inside uh, uh, of that, you would find that it was very glorious within. And, and uh, the glory of Jesus was a hidden glory. It was a veiled glory. He came to the earth born as a baby, and, and uh, he didn't lay aside his deity, but he veiled his deity. If you go inside the tabernacle, uh, which was seen only by the priests, it was glorious. The inner hangings were blue with purple and scarlet and with fine linen. Uh, the furniture was overlaid with gold. Everything was golden. Uh, everything, uh, the uh, Shekinah glory cloud of God set down upon that place. The mercy seat was in there. The Ark of the Covenant, all this light and glory from another world that was in there. The Bible says the Word became flesh uh, and dwelled among us. He tabernacled among us. The world could look at him and say, that's just another Jewish man. The world could look at him and say he ain't no different than anybody else but John said we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth he said you may just see a man on the outside he said but I see a God on the inside Amen Amen. And just as much as the Shekinah glory, when you saw the temple, when the glory cloud set down on the temple, it meant God was there, that he was present in the place on the life of Jesus, on the life of the Word. God's glory was present there. It set down on that place and showed that God was always there. Jesus had so much God on him of God the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm telling you, you say, what are you trying to give? I'm trying to tell you what God's Christmas gift was. It was himself. Amen. You're not going to get anything that good for Christmas this year. Not unless Christmas is the day you get born again. Then you've received a gift for those you that are saved. The Bible says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's Christmas. That's the meaning of Christmas. One. It's not about trees and gifts and life. Let me tell you something. Things are tough for people all over. It's not about how much money you've got because the greatest gift ever given cost you nothing. It bankrupted heaven, but it costed you nothing. You put your faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, come to the earth. Everything that God is, God saw something in us. And he said, you know what? These people, I want to save them. I want to give them opportunity to spend eternity with me. And God the, the thrice holy God of heaven robed himself in flesh, came through the womb of a virgin, and was born as a man. Because only a man can die for a man. If you were standing guilty before a judge today, you couldn't say, well, take my dog and kill him for my place because a man has to die for a man. Only a man could be a perfect substitute. The only way a man could be a, per, uh, a substitute for you is if that man was completely innocent. He could not have done anything wrong at all if Jesus came into the world sinless so he could die for guilty men. 
Jesus was 100% man, but at the same time 100% God. Therefore, when he died for man, he could die for all men. And so you and I can have life and have it more abundantly. Usually, what are you saying? I'm saying right now, the greatest gift is this. The word was made flesh and he dwelled among us. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came to earth to bleed and die. So you and I can have life and have it more abundantly. And let me tell you something. I don't care if you got a Christmas tree. I don't care if you got Christmas lights. I don't care if you got presents. Do you got Jesus? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And He came for you. Right. Could you imagine that? I'll be honest with you. There's some people, if you're standing on the side of the road freezing to death and called to come and get you, they ain't coming. Mm -hmm. But God came for you. Could you imagine what love that Jesus had for us? When we come into this thing, and I realize we're just at the tail end of November, we're coming into this thing, we gotta get our thinking right. You understand? We gotta get our minds right. Because everybody's sitting around, well, the economy, the economy, the economy, the economy. It ain't got nothing to do with the economy. It's got to do with Jesus. I hope you have the greatest thing and all the things that, but let me tell you something. What we need to be teaching our kids and what we need to be teaching our families Christmas is about a Savior that came in the flesh Amen. to die for our sins. Because I don't know how many more Christmases we're going to have before the Lord comes back to get us. Amen. And I want to know that I know him. I'm not worried about Santa Claus coming to town. I'm worried about Jesus is coming back. Have you been saved? Have you truly been saved? Do you know if you die right now that you go to heaven? You're not going to get saved by flesh and blood. You're not going to get saved by the will of flesh. You're not going to get saved by the will of man. You're going to get saved because you put your faith in the finished work of Jesus. Because he gave the greatest gift that could ever be. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of only begotten of the Father. Full of grace. And true. Let's stand with my head by my eyes closed.